And um, I also loved American Psycho, and I think Brett Easton Ellis is a genius. And I, I loved the opening of that film, you know, where he talks about you know how specific his morning routine is. And I started to think about that with, with like a female serial killer. And then I was like, well, why can't she be this really boss, empowered girl who, you know, runs a hedge fund? And I wanted to take sort of the, the, the gender stereotypes and flip them. Hello and greetings, everybody, and uh, happy International Women's Day. Uh, to mark this occasion, we have decided to uh, highlight highlight a film that's a little bit different. How is it a little bit different? Because it is the product of a female auteur, someone, a writer, director, and star who is bringing you know to the cinema a vision that is, that is a, a purely female vision, unclouded by. By, by bro influences, judgments, or points of view. I'm talking, of course, about the new art film, I would, I would describe it as, uh, You, Me, Madness, which is written, directed, and starring the wonderful Louise Linton, who you may know as being the wife of our former Treasury Secretary, Steve Mnuchin. And Steve Mnuchin is certainly part of the Chapo canon, you know. I mean, Suicide Squad was one of our first big movie episodes, and he, he produced that. And uh, did he produce this movie as well, do you think? I, I don't think he did, which is, okay. I think, pretty telling. Like, keep me away from this shit, please. I, I'm only involved in good movies. <laughs> I do see his touch here, though. Like, even if he didn't produce it, there is a Mnuchin sheen to it. Uh, the sheen, yes. absolutely. That oh awful my God. flat sheen. That, that yeah. It's, I, it's, well, I, I would like I wouldn't describe it that way. <laughs> I, I, I would describe <laughs> it as a soul that the movie has. <laughs> I would describe yes. This movie has Mnuchin sheen all over it. Which by that yeah. I mean it's like it's sort of very uh, gauzy neon and um, just sort of looks like a frogman. There's there's yeah, a frog man's frog fingers a, all over this. Your TV or monitor will never be the same after watching it. There's so many washed out whites and like weird brightnesses. And like the greatest art transcends technology, doesn't it? To the point where it literally harms it. Um, I imagine that you guys uh, having lower IQs than me uh, did not enjoy this movie as I did, but I've prepared a review. Oh, hell yes. School yeah, us. Spit. Okay. Spit. spit. Growing up is filled with adventures, but just as often misadventures. Everyone remembers that time they first associated due to mids and believed that they were Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's something everyone has experienced while coming of age, but it's usually just one and done. Most of us aren't lucky to feel that again. That's what I thought until me, you, madness. This movie is a tortoise force. <laughs> it is the only movie that has ever put me in a ketamine-like dissociative state where I believed I could channel the spirits of my ancestors through my Logitech G Pro wireless mouse. From the moment Miss Linton bursts on screen and issues a monologue that was actually written by Garth Ennis after he suffered a gunshot wound <laughs> to the head, I knew I was in for something special. Even with its gratuitous fourth wall breaks, the mentally taxing dialogue, and bizarre choices both in direction and plot, this is a movie about love. It's about what happens when one of those weird rat-faced L.A. guys that has an 8-pack and is secretly 38 bangs a woman <laughs> who is completely insane and a billionaire, like the real <laughs> Louise Win Linton. Many of our listeners' brothers are the rat-faced L.A. resident, and even though they've never sold their script or become an actor, the parents still like them more, and they could watch this movie to learn how to connect with that guy, to find out what his likes and dislikes and passions are. I don't want to spoil this movie too much, so I recommend that you get a disposable CBD vape that gets you high because you're, you're the only uh, social worker uh, who is drug tested. <laughs> you are my social worker who is significantly younger than me, alarmingly younger than me. I'm recommending this to you, my social worker. Uh, you got to smoke that vape that will be outlawed in three weeks. Get yourself your favorite meal that you love to cook. We all know it. A big bowl of rice that you cooked wrong. It is noticeably half raw and hurts your enamel to chew. And put on me, you madness, and let your body die. 
<laughs> oh, uh, wow. The Felix I mean, gives it 100 out of 100 stars, our highest rating. I mean... I mean, th- th- this is the work of an auteur. I mean, this is this yeah. is a singular vision in this movie. Absolutely, and a lot of times we can complain about like a lot of movies today are sort of, are you know, art by committee. They're designed yep. to 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 appeal to everyone and thus appeal to no one, and like they're based on existing IP. But here, here indeed, we have an, an original work, original characters, uh, like a, a completely. I mean, I wouldn't say a new concept, but this is. This is the product of, of one woman's vision and passion, yes. and I think I think she should be lauded for that. I mean, this is this is the story. I mean, if we're going to talk about you know International Women's Day, this is this is a story that's not often told in Hollywood by you know the the old boys network of of bros like Martin Scorsese, who you know makes movies about gangsters and people doing crimes instead of this movie, which is a rather it's it's a soulful portrait of. A bisexual woman with what's that word again? Mental, mental health, health issues, issues. Issues. Mental health issues. A bisexual woman with do the little twirl with your hand. Mental, mental health, health issues. issues. That's that's what this movie. That's 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 what it's about. It's a, it is a pure product of you know Louise Linton's brain. That's, yeah, that's, that's, like you said, uh, modern movies they are supposed to appeal to everybody, so they appeal to no one. This movie appeals to one person <laughs> yeah. on oh. Earth. <laughs> yes, yes. Which is that's amazing. You know what's that game where you like try to Google something and see if there's is only one hit, like a, a term, and you only get one hit on the whole internet, like a two word term. This is like that for movie making. It's amazing. I would just backtracking a little bit. I would say that Miss Linton is a combination of an artist and an auteur. If you get what I mean, <laughs> you combine both those words. <laughs> like, um, yeah, no, this is this is incredible. Like, you know how we talk a lot about how movies are like big budget movies, like this one. This movie costs thirteen billion dollars to make, and it shows. Uh, they're like you're supposed to get the maximum amount of people. You're supposed to get like every American who Tom pretends to be. <laughs> and then like all of China and like half of the UK or whatever. So it's just like the maximum thing. This movie's for no one. Yeah. No. Nope. Except the person that made it and started it. It's it's yep. it's it's almost it's almost commendable because it is like it's an anti movie. It is I, I'm not exaggerating here. Like this is the most violently hateful, immoral, and repellent movie I have ever seen. <laughs> yep. It's all it's amazing. I and it only it. exists because this lady is rich. Yep. It yes. is it, it is but a like, pure vanity project, but, but, but like with a, with an actual budget. It's like it's like if the if it's amazing because she actually knows like real Hollywood people as opposed to Tommy Wiseau. Yeah, and like she she's she's a terrible actress. There are basically only four speaking parts in this movie, and most of it takes place in in one location. So it has a it has sort of a. What is it like a locked room mystery quality to it, except there's no mystery at all. And it's funny. We're talking about um, just sort of bro movies and, and movies that that, that bros uh, love and but but missing. But in their love and affection for it, misinterpret the essential uh, moral or artistic message of the film. Like, you know, people who who watch Goodfellas and think it's about, you know, guys who are cool, being friends with each other, having fun and just being the boss. This movie is exactly like that but the movie that it's misinterpreting is american psycho like this is a movie for people who watched american psycho you know that very subtle movie that's hard to hard to suss out what the moral point of view is and and how it presents its characters this is for people who saw american psycho and were like yeah patrick bateman is the man and in fact uh living your life like him and having his exact brain uh, makes you cool and funny and a genius yeah, they even, so she, at the start of the movie, she does, like, a Bateman-esque thing, where it's like, you know, I take good care of my body, I use blah, 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 I, I, I'm up to, you know, a thousand crunches, but, like, this, they do this about three times, but during the second one, she goes, yes, and I know this is from American Psycho. Oh, there is so much meta, for yeah, there is so yeah, much meta yeah. fourth wall breaking, and also, like, a very... Like a, a very virulent strain of like what, what adds that meta context, a virulent strain of soy banter in this movie that is but, uh, yeah, a violently oppressive, like but also, truly damaging. But also my favorite thing about this movie, one of my favorite things about it is that there is an overarching political message that's like 
the same it, it, that like isn't it's like the message of like persuasion magazine <laughs> yes like, it is you should it really be nice is. to people if they're democrats or republicans yep. or you that, should just be yeah. nice to people <laughs> like, i mean like i said that we can we can delve into the moral universe of this movie which like yeah. i said is the, the bleakest and most terrifying thing i think i've ever encountered in yeah. any artistic medium but it, it's just like to describe this movie it's just like ima- like so imagine instead of having a screenplay or a plot you would pad out 90 minutes with the person writing and starring in it was like what if instead of writing a screenplay i can just through voiceover narration simply state everything that's in my head and and but but set it to all of the most popular songs of the 1980s. Like, Felix, you mentioned this movie cost $13 billion to make. They certainly didn't spend it on special effects or sets or anything like that. They spent all $13 billion on the royalties to, I would say, no less than a dozen of the most popular songs of the 1980s. You're talking Duran Duran, New Order, AHA. Yeah, the entire song, not just like, like full worldwide rights in perpetuity to have completely unedited just like a music video featuring uh, take yeah aha take on me hungry like the wolf uh, blue monday uh, i mean the list goes on and on like if it's a movie from the 80s i mean if it's a song from the 80s that like you're like oh i know that song that's that's a that's a bop it's in this movie and it pads out i would say probably half the running time yeah yeah and you know what as i started thinking about the Mnuchin connection to this this is so much like suicide squad Suicide Squad also plays like M- entire Eminem songs. Suicide Squad also like loves the fourth wall soy bands. I I think there is like a style of Minucci in film, and this is like this. I used to think Suicide Squad was the pinnacle, but this is it. A lot of people use the word Lynchian incorrectly to describe anything that's vaguely weird, but I think we should start using Minuchian to describe just a, a broad swath of our popular culture. Yeah, I would. Would you call Venom a Minuchian film? It 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 has elements of Mnuchinism in it, yeah. I would say. Yeah, yeah. But I I mean, I get the sense I like this movie a lot more than you guys did. But we should we should get into telling telling the wanna, listeners what happened. I want to get into the, the movie. We can we can go through the movie itself, but before we get into it, I would like to talk a little bit about Louise Linton herself because I mean it's impossible to separate this movie from the auteur. And you know, we we probably Mostly know Louise. We become fans of her only through her marriage to our former frog face surgery secretary and producer of Suicide Squad, Steve the, Mnuchin. The best member of the Trump cabinet. Like, bar oh, none. Absolutely. Like, I'm sorry. Bar none. This guy, like, say, I'm sorry. He saved the world multiple times. If you want to talk about, like, a good Republican, like, this fucking, like, fucking freak reptile that probably would have served in the hillary administration absolutely he would have he could have been treasury secretary under clinton yeah he just like an all-purpose guy like that he prevented trump from invading venezuela he like convinced them to send money out to keep rates like he's yeah he's a bad guy for sure but like probably the best republican on earth i would say like probably the least malign influence in there so like we already love him we already love him for Suicide Squad, and his wife even cooler. I mean, I love him just for his face. Just like his the face way is he look, awesome. the way he looks is is very singular. It and makes you me know, happy I mean, like, every time I see him. When you think of Louise Linton, and I'm sure it'll be the episode art. I mean, you got to talk about the truly unbelievable photograph of her and her husband at the fucking uh, like print where they the place where they the, at the money factory. Yeah, they just pull a sheet of hundreds off the fucking press and she's holding it with like a single leather glove. Like it's like a like a diaper or something. And that's, just, what I, yeah, that's what I that's what I love. That's what I first fell in love with them. The fact that the secretary of the treasury, he was the only guy I've ever seen in my lifetime at a cabinet level position who's like, yeah, my wife goes to work with me every day. <laughs> it's like they're rod and todd and no one else has ever done that like the president doesn't do that but he's like like uh, oh i have to go to china to talk about the you know the m3 global money supply my wife is my wife has to come (laughs) (laughs) my my wife come (laughs) and i don't know what that's about but it's awesome. I love it. He that. also apparently doesn't know how to sign his name or he doesn't know cursive because if you look at any of the bills, the dollar bills that were printed during his tenure as Treasury Secretary, because, you know, they always have the Treasury Secretary's signature on them, 
His is in block lettering. His signature is not a signature. He just wrote his name in in caps. <laughs> it's like in an application where it says print name here. Signature yeah. Below. He just went with the print name part. Yeah. Like he's a baby. He is baby. He is baby. Uh, I also I, I became obviously a fan of her Instagram. And if you like do some Instagram sleuthing, you can find like she's always tagging her Pilates instructor in a lot of her Instagram <laughs> posts. Yeah. And if you find his Instagram page, let's just say she is featured rather heavily on the uh, the Instagram of her personal trainer, you know? I mean... Yeah, no. We read into that whatever whatever you like. She but likes I mean, fitness? Me. Is that yeah. a crime now? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, in, in, in looking, I was just had to, like, just sort of just look into Louise Linton just a little bit because I, I was thinking there was another story there, maybe. And lo and behold, there definitely is. Uh, under the controversy section of her Wikipedia, there's a whole thing about how... Um, uh, she, she, she wrote a memoir called In Congo's Shadow about the gaff year she did as a 19-year-old in Zambia, where she was literally like the Instagram girl, like posing next to an African child with like the caption, like, you know, hashtag their soul is, is mine or something like that. But uh, I just want to read here. This is from the uh, NPR. Sorry, it says a, a self-published memoir about a Brit British actress's gap year in Zambia has come under fire this week. Citizens of Zambia, along with other Africans and aid workers, are using social media to highlight the factual errors they're calling condes in the condescending tone about life and culture in the country. She's Jenna Maroney. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like, she's like if Jenna Maroney like married into the highest level of government. Well, like, the difference I is, though, her. Jenna Maroney is, uh, you know, she grew up on a houseboat in Florida. Uh, right. Uh, Louise Linton's Scottish. And her family owns a castle. Yeah, no, that is that is an important distinction that this is she's has an ancient bloodline. And I would argue it informs a lot of the choices she makes and way she behaves. I just uh, want to quote here uh, from the book. Here's an excerpt, an excerpt being quoted by NPR. This is Louise Linton writing in her memoir in Congo's shadow. I mean, I guess she's talking about King Leopold or something. <laughs> Which is probably related to her fucking family. Yeah, exactly. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah, no, literally, probably her great, great, great uncle. Uh, so it says here, uh, quote, my innocent dreams of teaching the villagers English or educating them about the world now seem ridiculously naive. With a cheery smile, I'd waved goodbye to my dad and jumped on a plane to Africa without researching anything about its tumultuous political history or realizing that, <laughs> or realizing that was the political. history of Africa. <laughs> I love her, dude. Uh, uh, it's a land of contrast, I'll say that. <laughs> or, real or realizing that my destination was just miles from war-torn Congo. I still sometimes feel out of place. Whenever that happens, though, I try to remember a, smile, a smiling gap-toothed child with HIV whose greatest joy was to sit on my lap oh and my drink from a bottle God. of Coca-Cola. <laughs> oh, my God. A smiling gap-toothed child with HIV whose greatest joy in life was to sit on my lap oh and my sip Coca-Cola. I'm imagining that she's got, like, the glass bottle with the fucking, like, a uh, baby nipple on the end and she's just sucking on it. <laughs> she's... She fucking rocks. I love her. She, uh, according to critics, she mixes Zambia, Congo, and Rwanda so many times, leading to generalizations of Africa as one big country, something we have been trying to fight for a while now, a critic says. She also claims that there are child soldiers in Zambia, which um, during the time, which is just simply not true. <laughs> <laughs> what a humanitarian. Um, but yeah, like, so, so. Yeah, so just just try to keep like like that paragraph about her time with with beautiful African children who's like who, whose eyes and souls lit up for the first time ever when they saw a gorgeous Scottish teenager yeah. teach them yeah. English or give them a uh, soda soda for the first time. Miss um, Louise, Miss Louise, I have never read a word. Please help me. <laughs> <laughs> of course I will. <laughs> I didn't even know she was Scottish because when this movie started, I was like, why is she speaking with this kooky half accent that she goes in and out of? Like, what, is this a character choice? But no, like this movie is just her. There's no, yeah, there's, no there is no acting here whatsoever. This movie is just purely she's like, what if what if everyone knew how cool I was and what a naughty, cheeky lass I, I really am? And so yeah. I'm not I'm not just the secretary of treasury, the former secretary of the treasury's wife. I'm actually an insane woman with mental health issues and <laughs> um let's again clarify the 
best person who has been in American government in the last 50 years <laughs> is, Louise is Louise Linton. Is Louise Linton? Yes, yeah, yes. both of them. Well, they're a, they're a deal. They're like they were they yeah. were both Yeah, it's confirmed. like it's like yeah. what uh, Bill Clinton said when they got elected with Hillary. It's you get two for one. Yeah. I also looked at her IMDb and she's listed as an actress, but her her credits are rather threadbare. I mean, she's like been on an episode of CSI and Criminal Minds and she was in the remake of Cabin Fever. And it's had tiny parts in other movies, but it's only about she has about like 10 or 11 IMDb credits as an actress. Yeah. Uh, and one of them uh, came because the pr- uh, producers claim that uh, she was allowed to be in a movie uh, called The Echo because her first husband, who is a lawyer in L.A., who she's divorced a number of years ago, paid him two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> love that for her. Um, yeah. How did her and Mnuchin meet? Have we ever found that out? They met at a, uh, let me find it here. They met them at a wedding. Re- she met him at a wedding reception uh, in 2013. They were, they were wedding crashing together, I guess. Uh, they met over the shrimp puffs. Mm, and like, they got married oh. during the Trump presidency. Mike Pence was the officiant. Oh, I remember oh. that. Like, right, <laughs> yeah, like the second day of the Trump presidency, he was like, guess what, everyone? And we're getting married. Yep. It, that was awesome. Tale um, as old as time. Yeah, that was... Beauty and Manooch. You you have to figure, like, any woman, any beautiful woman, Steve, Steve Mnuchin, you know, <laughs> at the Make Your Own Caesar Salad Concoction Bar, <laughs> and is like, that's the hottest fucking guy I've ever seen in my life. And I then... Just, I can't wait don't his even find out all until over you, me. You don't even find out until you marry him that he's a billionaire. That doesn't come in. You don't think about that at all. You're just like, I want him inside me. I want him to see. I want him to do that thing with his lip while he's just, we're, we're doing that Mormon thing where the guy just sleeps inside of the woman for eight hours. <laughs> 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 all right. Well, okay. So like I said, keep, keep all that in mind. And then let's, let's, let's go into the movie itself. Okay. So. God, I mean, it, it's it, it, it's really hard to describe because like there's there's not a lot of plot here, but like the, you know, this not this is art. This is not about plot. This is about yeah, vibe. No. This movie is about about a vibe, and and the vibe she's going for is um, an unbelievably wealthy woman who has all the best clothes, furniture, cars, jewelry, everything. But also, um, um, in addition to her job as a, a hedge fund manager where she kills people, you know, through the economy, she also murders them for fun for herself because, like, this is the way she blows off steam is that, like, she's addicted to drugs and exercise. And it's just, like, every, everything about this movie is just, is just wealth pornography, but it's, like, the gaudiest, ugliest kind of wealthy person you can be. Yeah. It's, like, like the, most of the movie takes place in this house that looks like a fucking... It, it looks like an air conditioner, like built into a Malibu hill. It's like yeah. one of the ugly, it's one of the ugliest places I've ever ever seen in my life. It's 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 awful. Yeah. And the thing is, like, she also makes. There's another really important thing about this movie is that she has to have a different outfit in every single scene she's in. Often in scenes that take place like concurrently, like five minutes of screen of like film reality time have elapsed, and she's changed outfits like three times. And every yeah. outfit looks like dog shit. Half the time, yeah, yeah she, she looks, it like, looks shit. like she's got a fucking like a coat hanger stuck in the back of the fucking dress, like just insane uh, shoulder pads and shit. I, huge I had boots. A, yeah, so I had a friend in Chicago who uh, he was like quite a few years older than us when we were in high school, and like you would go to his place and there would just be random shit there. Like there would be like a huge fish tank or like a slot machine from a casino. Or like a seat from an airplane, <laughs> and it was like, "What? How did you get this?" And it was like, he would just find a way uh, of revealing that he basically stole it without admitting that. And he kept these like little like airplane bottles of like vodka and Captain Morgan and shit on top of the slot machine. And because we were like, you know, seventeen, sixteen, we we're like, "Can we drink these?" He's like, "No, these are collector's items." <laughs> and that guy, like that guy, he was awesome but like also like he was one of those guys like we've all known someone like this who like their plan is to like get horribly injured by like something like the government or exxon Mobil does and sue them or like just find a big bag of money 
And this, the design of this movie is if that happened. If any guy or girl like that just like fulfilled their dreams of finding what, like $500 million like in their backyard. It is all the shittiest things you could buy if you were a billionaire. Everything is like strangely boxy and has this weird like candy coated sheen on it. And I like, I like how unabashed it is in its awful taste. But like, but th- th- this movie is not self aware of that at all. It's not like it's no. playing. It's not like it's playing with your perception and like presenting the wildly like out of skew, both morality and personal taste and like character. Of, like it's presenting you like their unfiltered perspective on their own life, but like in a self aware way. No, you're supposed way. to think they're cool. Like no, yeah. like yeah, you are absolutely supposed to think that she is the height of success, wealth luxury sexiness wittiness and 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 being the best murderer ever i i just in my notes here like the this is one sentence review of this movie is uh ugly woman lives in ugly house like that's basically the plot of this movie <laughs> uh, for, first of all she's perfect but yeah that her taste her house suck she does kind of look face tuned we got to admit that oh yeah she's one of those people who has real life face tuned so yeah, it's a, the movie begins and like she's at her job and she does the American Psycho monologue because like I and really even says that she says like yeah. this is the American yeah. Psycho. We've said before that like a cardinal sin of movies is don't reference a movie that's better than the movie you're making, and they reference literally hundreds of films in this movie, and every single one of them is better than it. And by yeah. and by reference, I don't mean like quote it visually or make a subtle allusion to. I mean yeah, just say Louise, the name. Louise Louise Linton will turn to the camera and address you the audience and say, "Doesn't this remind you of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that movie we all liked?" Yeah. And I I again, I can't stress this enough. 90% of the words spoken in this movie are in voiceover narration dictated by Louise Linton. There's like there's there's very little dialogue. It is mostly just her unfiltered thoughts telling you about how cool and good her life is one of the first things she does is that she's at her desk and there's a spider climbing on one of her orchids and she has a monologue about uh, spider copulation and about how male spiders are so horny that they'll risk having the female kill and eat them and then she just takes the spider and eats it she just pops she's a it twist. in her mouth she's a yeah. twisted psychopath there's no two <laughs> words about yeah. it yeah. she's like the jocker <laughs> yeah she's, she's a lady jocker it's true. Yeah. More like, than Harley hey, Quinn. Hey, hey, I'm rich and successful and glamorous and also a fucking psycho. Um, so like, I guess like the, the plot, as, you know, as it exists, uh, begins where it's like she, so she comes home from her, her job um, just, just accumulating wealth. She loves getting money. It's the best drug in the world outside. It's the best way you can get your rocks off outside um, uh, being, getting your rocks off with a girl is uh, getting money and creating more slaves for the afterlife. Um, so uh, the plot kicks off. She, she's home for the weekend, and she makes clear that, like, the weekends, I work 80 hours a week, so I can spend the weekends with, on me time. It's me having fun and just being decadent and excessive. So uh, she, she gets home, and uh, who's waiting for her at her home but a uh, former star of Gossip Girl and a recently canceled actor, Ed Westwick, who is sort of yes, this, like, sir. He's, 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 the, he's the aforementioned rat-faced L.A. guy who is showing up to this fucking, like I said, air conditioning box mansion in the Malibu Hills um, because she has put an ad for a roommate on Craigslist. And he's showing up to to rent a room from this absurdly wealthy woman. And like, and, you know, it's also at no point is there any tension about like, oh, like, what's this guy's real deal? Because she just tells you in voiceover that he's a petty thief and a con man who is only replying to the ad to case the joint to steal from her. So, like, we're, we're well aware of what this guy's deal is and the fact that she's aware of it from, from the get-go. So, like, the, the idea that this is any kind of, like, a... I know, I know in her mind she thinks this, this is, like, a very, very, like, sort of elegant and sophisticated cat and mouse game between the two of them. And they're like, oh, they, are they going to fall in love or not? But, no, it's, it's all just right there up front from the beginning. There's, there's no tension wrung out of any of this at all. So, like, he's this... He's this like shitty LA guy. How how would you describe him? I mean, I, all I notice about him is that he has a flannel shirt tied around his waist for the entire movie, but is also wearing like he's wearing a grunge guy tied around his waist flannel shirt, but also is wearing like eight hundred dollar a pair of, like fucking like designer jeans. You know the kinds of like sort of the knee pads on them that are yeah yeah yeah. yeah. He looks like 
It's like what a guy who never left Indonesia would be like, okay, describe a cool American. <laughs> but yeah, no, he is, yeah, rat faced LA guy. Ed Westwick has one of the rattiest faces. It's amazing how far he went. Yeah, it's crazy. He looks like he should yeah. be gnawing on drywall every single scene. <laughs> yeah. he's in. But I feel like I have a theory that all the rat faces matriculated to LA. There's something about like the toxic air and water that is calming to them. It's like how rats sometimes like, if you've ever had a basement, you can sometimes get an awful stench because rats like something about the walls. They like burrowing in and then not being able to get out and dying there. And that's what L.A. is to guys like Ed Westwood. <laughs> and this movie is its stench. And there is a beauty in death. But um, he's supposed to be like a shithead, like millennial who doesn't try that hard, but is really hot and is actually a really smart guy, but chooses to be amoral. Yeah, so so he's a con man, and he's looking to he's looking to rob this rich lady who's dumb enough to like you know let him stay at her house. But like I just I had one note here in, in the screenplay, uh, because you know written by Louise Linton. There's a really funny part where like they're uh, she offers him a drink, and they're like having cocktails together. And uh, Ed Westwick's character says to her, "You can really hold your booze for a wee gal." And it's just like, there's your Scottish brain coming out. No one talks like that in America, you stupid idiot. Like, he's, he's just like, for a wee loss, you sure can knock back your martinis. Yeah. And it's just like, that's the way she thinks people talk. Because, again, none of these characters are real. Like, none, they're not even trying to appropriate, like, approach a real person or depict anything outside of Louise Linton's brain. And that's why I think it's, like, kind of brilliant. Yeah, it, it speaks to the utter... Uh obviously narcissism, but isolation of people of that kind of wealth. They don't interact with people. They, they, the only people they interact with are essentially servants, like people who cannot even like look them in the eye if they want to get a paycheck. So they don't have human interactions. Yeah. So they're like, oh, I'm going to make a movie. Of course, it just has to be like, what if it was about me, but I killed people? And then, well, what about, you know, all the theme, thematic elements and, and uh, aesthetics? Well, I'll just reference all the movies that I already saw. And just to make sure nobody thinks that's derivative, I will say that I'm ripping them off, which makes it postmodern and smart. I would argue the fact that this is the only movie I've ever seen that completely takes place in someone's own mind. <laughs> yeah. Like, I would, like, that is postmodern. That's not what they were intending to do. Like, they're just like, oh, I'm a cool woman making a movie about how cool I am. When really, like, as you said, it reveals, like, her singular loneliness and isolation from... I mean, that's like those personal trainer photos. Uh, I don't... Neoliberal Dad on Twitter is another big Mnuchin head. And... Oh, he's one he, of the best he, Mnuchin experts out there. Yeah, he's a Mnuchin expert, and he always sends me great Mnuchin stuff. And great stuff in general. Very smart guy. But he loves showing me Mnuchin with her trainers, <laughs> as Will alluded to. And it made me think about that stereotype about, like, the rich younger woman fucking her trainer, right? And I, the more I think about it, and, and after what Matt said, I don't even think that's because they're hot or whatever. It's because it's, like, that's the closest thing to a normal person. Yeah. They yeah. can talk to. That's, that's like valid. Attractive... That's the only type of validation. Yeah, it's the only attractive man that you have anything close to a even relationship with in your day to day life. Yeah, you know, this movie portrays that not in her like fucking her trainer or something, but like the only person she interacts in this movie that is like on anything like a human or friendly level is the is the is the Vietnamese man that she berates into doing her nails on his time. And like he, he make she she makes this like nail salon guy come to her apartment because her gel manicure got chipped, and like he he has to come by on Friday at six thirty to like re to fix her nails, and like they, then they have like they they just do like they quiz each other on Trivial Pursuit while he's doing her nails, but like it's like yeah, but like it, it's it's only the people who serve her that she has any real human interaction with at all. And another another part about her character and Louise Linton in general is that multiple times in this movie she states outright that she is a borderline personality with sociopathic and narcissistic tendencies, but she says it like it's an achievement, like new <laughs> well, new yeah. character mode unlocked. Like it's I had to work hard to get this narcissistic and borderline. I love that because it's like my, one of my favorite things, and it's happening more now than it used to, is when a woman lies like how a man does. It's pretty rare. Most male lies are like, 
oh yeah, no, my parents took me to the doctor when I was ten. I have the same disease as Dexter. I'm, <laughs> I'm a psych- I'm a psychopath. I'm crazy, but I only would want to kill bad people. I actually got turned down from the army because I like my my heartbeat was too low when I was watching footage of beheadings. Uh, I like. I got a scholarship for playing soccer, but I got bored with it. I've like, yeah, I, I've like fucked every woman I've met. I, I, the real Chris Kyle taught me like how to shoot guns, blah, blah, blah. Women lies are like weird and like have to do with like some insane social thing that you have no idea what it is. And like are part of a larger like social machination, but sometimes, and this is still rare. A woman will be like, I'm thinking of some of the amazing woman lies I've heard. You, I look, know, like, you look great in that outfit. <laughs> Honey, um, slay. You look wonderful. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's like usually what the woman lies. It's yeah. like, well, the meanest thing women do, men and women have different meanest things they do, but the meanest thing a woman does is when they have their friend that's ugly, <laughs> it's a picture where they look terrible and they're like, you're perfect. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, I met a few women in my life who like, in the course of my travels, who were like, one said that she walked 19 miles every night because she was going to be a Green Beret psychologist. <laughs> and this was like, this was like a really attractive, she was like early 20s. We were both in our early 20s and it was like, wait, what? Rewind? <laughs> it's like, I thought that was a, a one-off. And I've since met like one other person that does this. And I, I love it. It's so, I think it's a product of like the internet and how, now, even like a hot woman can be as socially isolated as a man, uh, because that's that's all this is. This is all just like a very childish attempt to impress and intimidate and win people over. That's really all that like that insane type of lying is. And like now even like, yeah, really pretty women will do it. And Louise Linton channeled that. And I lo- like I love that. Like I, I I'm a big believer that you have to like hold on to every weird bit of culture you have to preserve it. You have to let people know it existed because otherwise you'll miss a rich tapestry of the world. And in my ideal archive of the arts, this movie would be there for that reason. Well, so, so as the plot develops, so she, she, she drugs Ed Westwick. She like roofies him with a martini and then like he passes out and then she begins preparing. for. Talk her. about a reversal of fortunes for Ed Westwick. <laughs> She uh, she begins preparing for her for a fun evening of of, of murder and and hijinks and uh, like and then Ed Ed Westwick uh, he sort of like wakes up and she's and she she has invited over to her apartment like one of the other only characters in this movie which is just a chi- a really hot Chinese woman that she um, is bisexual and mentally ill with <laughs> yeah, yeah that was I love that it's just like that is so like thirteen year old boy. Oh, uh, you think I'm cool? You haven't heard the best of it. I fuck a Chinese lady, <laughs> and she's got, got she's got sexy tattoos. She has yeah. sexy tattoos. And then if if ripping off American Psycho blatantly wasn't enough, this movie also makes a point that um, Louise uh, prepares a, a a a wonderful Michelin star meal for uh, her her girlfriend and Ed Westwick, but they but 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 out of human bodies. And she makes yeah. him eat, she makes him eat a guy's testicles, and he's like, "This is really good." And she's talking to her girlfriend in Mandarin, where he's like, "Can you believe this ignorant pig is eating another ignorant pig who's a man?" I want to talk a little bit about like the American Psycho, They're, because I feel like they reference that more than any other movie yeah. in this. American Psycho is one of my I I love that book. I feel like people like improperly appraise it because Brad Easton Ellis is annoying. Which like, show me a fucking author that is yeah. Yeah, um, but the book and the movie are both great for different reasons. They're both hysterical, I think. The book is, I think, particularly funny, but they do have, like, the common thing in both of them is the point is, like, Patrick Bateman's a fucking loser. Yeah. Like, he's not cool. He's totally vacant. Everyone makes fun of him. He sucks. He's the, the biggest defining feature of Patrick Bateman is that he's totally vacant and has no qualities. And it's so telling that she's like, yeah, I'm cool like Patrick Bateman, <laughs> who's the biggest loser in that movie and in that book. So, uh, so like, so yeah, he, so, so like he's being wined and dined by these, by these two uh, sort of uh, female predators 
and but but because he's a dumb guy and like the thing is like also his friend is calling him to be like yeah like have you have you done the job yet have you have you have you done the 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 the, the crimes that we're planning to do to this woman he's like he's like you know he's like calm down man like you know i'm, I'm working on it but like you know, there's something there, you know, like, I think she digs me. Like, I think I'm, I think, I think she's gonna let me smash or whatever. And then the guy's like, don't forget, you're here to do crimes. So like, but he's obviously sprung for Louise Linton and, and the possibility of having a threesome with her and her, um, a beautiful tattooed Chinese lady. So then what do they do? They all take Molly and have a pool party together. And lo and behold, what happens? They have a threesome together. And this is like, an, I, I think this, this is what interested me about like the interesting way that this movie portrays sex and violence is because, like, obviously, it's 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 about sex and violence and how cool they are and like you know uh, and, and how glamorous it is if you're really good at both sex and violence. But the thing is, it the way it portrays both uh, like like murders or, or violence and then like the sex itself is very prudish. It's this very sanitized vision of both of 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 all of you know the transaction of bodily fluids one way or the other. Where it's just like they have a threesome together, and it's like it's like a kissing threesome. Yeah, it's just yeah, like they just smooch. Yeah. They're just smooching in bed together, and then like all the violence is like totally sanitized too. So like I, I just picked up on something there about, about like like what extreme wealth does to you psychologically, where like you know yes people become objects for you, they become disposable instruments of your own pleasure, but you don't want to focus on like the act itself at all. It's just yeah. like, it's 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 like mentioning the brands. And it's like showing you the, like, and telling you what a nice uh, couch. Oh, sorry, couch, uh, sofa, not couch. That that's oh five god, minutes. no, don't do that's that. That's about five minutes of dialogue. Oh god, that was, that was one of the best scenes I've ever. <laughs> I felt like I was getting beat in the head with a bag of oranges. But you know what I mean? Though? It's just like, like she she views herself as sort of this like alpha female, uh, like you know, sex and violence predator, like a jungle cat or whatever. And she's she's it's just implied that she's so good at sex, but and like her being good at sex is is linked to her being that good at killing people. But the way it's portrayed is like very PG. Yes. Yes. Yeah, because the things themselves you can't enjoy them because you have unlimited access to them. You can only catalog them. So everything is totally like bloodless and and and. Uh, and yes, dis- it's and, bloodless. And abstract it. I mean, there is blood in this movie, but you could mistake it. You forget that it's there because it's like it's a few little scenes or whatever. But I mean, there's even one line where Ed Westwick is still saying like, "Hey, I'm surprised there wasn't more blood there." Yeah. You know, and it's just like it, it's the same with it. I mean, she. And again, what's so extraordinary about this is that she, I think, she views this movie as being like an erotic thriller or like an erotic yes. satire, or th- th- there's something like it just in, like sort of like just so powerfully sexy about her as an individual that she can do and say anything. And like, the thing is like she, you know, she's like conventionally attractive, but like her performance in this movie is like anti erotic. There is nothing. Yeah. There is. It's like, you want to talk the about way she so- dresses, the way she moves. Uh, every yeah, time they yeah. to do like a sexy montage. At one point she's, they're showing her trying to like seduce at Westwick wearing like a fucking fire boots <laughs> like you s- s- spray painted gold at just this giant triangular uh, shouldered dress, and she runs her hands like through her hair, but presumably because of like extensions or something, she can't actually like run it through her <laughs> it hair. Yeah. So she just like kind of grabs a chunk of it and moves it around in slow motion. Yeah, she's and- like she has the sexual appeal and aura of a special razor designed for men to have six blades. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same, like, it's the same packaging. And there's, and like, so much of this movie is her sharing her, like, her awesome 80s playlist with you, the audience, and with Ed Westwick. And there's all these, like, these dance numbers where they're just like, gotta, they're playing the song from Footloose, you know, and they're like, gotta, gotta cut loose. Or is, was that the song? Mm-hmm. I, 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 it was, it was, I think it was Footloose, but like there, there's scenes of them just dancing by themselves or with each other. And, and Louise Linton's character is literally like her, her, her deadly, the deadliest of the species, the female. Her dance of seduction and violence and murder is like Elaine Bettis from Seinfeld at the company party. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Her, it's her jerking around like she's having a seizure or something to aha, take on me. It's more like a full body dry heave, set the music. <laughs> Because there's this all the thing she's trying to also she's trying to be sexy, but then she also tries to do gags and stunts. She tries to do bits, <laughs> physical comedy bits that are just brutally terrible. 
Uh, and uh, sometimes you can kind of like tell that she knows that she doesn't really have it. She's not Jim Carrey. So she'll throw in like sound effects, Looney Tunes esque wacky sound effects while she's moving and speed up the film so that it's funny. And I swear to God, at least two post production included farts. Yes, okay. just to try yes. to yeah, yeah, yes. some yes. sort of okay. comedy yes. out of something. Yes. Can, I, can I defend this movie? I'm actually surprised Matt is criticizing this. This would be considered the funniest movie ever made in Germany. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like just Louis like Linton, just the gas. Yeah. Louis Linton has the comedic chops of a European. We can definitely say that. Like this movie should be taken as proof that Scotland should join the EU. <laughs> if this is like how they process comedy, yeah. They're more German or fucking whatever than anything. So uh so 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 they have sex. And basically, like they just they're like that sex was such good sex. It was. I, lo- yeah, I, no, it. I love yeah, to have it, good we sex. Did right, it, yeah. We did it so good. <laughs> that it reminded me of something. Me and Matt for a time for my stories watch Gilmore Girls. Yeah, foundational American dramas. And oh, there's wow. a character on Gilmore Girls who Lorelai dates who, like Which the one? actor, Which one? to just absolve myself, my brother is the one who pointed this out, not me. Clearly, gay actor, right? Which which act which, which which boyfriend are we talking here? Jason, With the Chris Eigenman character. Yeah, the Chris, Chris Eigenman, by the way, who played the uh, thinly veiled literary analog of my father in the film adaptation of The Treatment. A character with a gay son. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I don't I don't know, but like my brother. See, Jason I mean, was not, my favorite of Lorelai's boyfriends, but but I digress. I digress. But, but but yeah yeah. So it was like he um, <laughs> they just fucked, and it was the morning after, and he went. That was some pretty great sex we had, and it's like <laughs> convincing. Same thing, like it, it's like I my brain has like a catalog of those, and it's that from Gilmore Girls. And then uh, when Cory Booker said, "Me and Rosario would be the first White House wedding in a while," where it's like, mm, yeah, mm. Uh, it's more like from the Simpsons, like zero the, sexuality from the Hunks dating show, where they're like, "Which one of your girls said he was so sexy? I hope that we would have sex." Like that. That's what this. That's what this movie. Yeah, yeah. They're just like. They're like. Wow, that was such good sex, and I would know because I'm so good at having sex. And then I also, bet. Ed Westwick says like, you know, you're really special, and you're not just sexy, but you're also very funny, special, intelligent, <laughs> and charming. Yeah. Oh my god. And, and then she, and then like, and then like the gears are turning in her head, and she's like, oh wait, maybe I won't kill this guy because actually, I I like him. There's something there in how sexy he is and how good he is at having sex. But also, he's sort of sensitive and sweet, too, because he's able to see through my BPD, narcissist, psychopathic personality to see that, actually, I'm a pretty special, unique individual who's actually like got a good heart. <laughs> yeah, that's, the, yeah, that's what makes him great. Oh, there's two things that she likes about him. One is that he likes her, and the other is that he uh, knows enough about video games to uh, prevent her from selling some stock in a video game maker when he tells her some shit about how actually these guys make a very popular video game that zero people on earth would not know if they had that much money invested in the company. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, also, yeah. Like his, also, his reason for like not divesting from the company is that like they're going to come out with another game. Yeah. They, yeah they, no they're shit. announcing another game. And it's like, wouldn't that be priced in? Yeah. Like that's like they'd be like, I thought they just made one game and they're done. I'm <laughs> <No>. selling. <laughs> this company's over. <laughs> like it's, it's it's so good. I want it. I realized what the scenes with Ed Westwick like that remind me of. It's Liz Lemon and astronaut Mike Dexter. <laughs> 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 but like just played like totally straight yeah so so yeah but like uh the, the, she's thinking like oh maybe there's something here and he's thinking it too but you know like I, it, it comes to head for like she kicks him out and she's like you know we, we will never be a couple because you know I, I you know you're younger than me and poorer and he's just like okay well then he takes that opportunity to uh to steal her like classic you know dodge challenger and some of her jewelry and and he fucks off. But then there's a scene where she goes to spin class, and there's like a fat, ugly guy next to her who gets a boner looking at her. And then he and then she kills her, kills him for getting a boner and like being gross and just being like fat and ugly. And which is very funny because That's of the way she justifies killing people later in the movie. But like she she and multiple times in this movie, she's like Ed Westwick is like, 
Aren't you worried about, you know, blah, blah, aren't you worried about the prospect of criminal prosecution? Uh, you'll go to jail for like a long time. And by a long time, I mean like uh, forever. And she's like, no, I've never considered it for a moment because I am simply uh, too intelligent and perfect at getting away with murder. And then she murders this fat guy from the spin class in the parking lot yeah. of the spin class yeah. center and just like beats him to death with her handbag, with her bare hands, and then like barely can get his fat ass in the trunk of her car. And it's just sort of like, yeah, she's pulling like, at the what? Thing for like, like 20 what? Like, minutes. What? This is not what good is this? OPSEC. This is not like, like a planned, uh, calculated murder that you like set up to avoid being caught doing. Prez Belusky from The Wire could be reinstated on the force by solving that murder. <laughs> <laughs> any shitty like the shittiest dumbest cop could solve that like that is the case they would give to constable bob from justified so and then like she's like oh you stole from me i'm very angry and then she like calls him and she's like if you don't return my car and jewelry and come back to the house and keep this plot going for another 40 minutes uh, i'm going to give <laughs> all of your information to the nypd and he's like nypd don't you mean lapd and she's like oh wow this guy's got over on me this guy's pretty smart, oh, too. Oh, boy. Oh, but, boy. But, but, just... but, like, financial crimes, like, it's not like Dukes of Hazard, where you, like, rip off people's bank accounts and you in New York and you get to California. And NYPD is like, oh, shucks, boys. They, caught, they crossed the state line. We can't get them. Like, if you commit financial crime, I'm pretty sure the FBI goes after you. I mean, like, he, yeah, he's just he's just doing like confidence schemes and just stealing from people's apart houses and shit like that, just like stealing from rich people. So, you know, he he comes back and then she's just like, I've, I'm I'm quite bothered, you know, this is a right spot of bother. I'm going to murder you now. And he's just like, what? But I thought we had like chemistry. Like, wasn't that sex good? And she was like, yes, dear, it very much was. But I'm still going to murder you. And the movie goes on for like another forty minutes. I mean, like, oh it's just god, them, it's just them just taping them, around this fucking just house, going around it, literally going around in circles of the apartment. She's like, kind of hap- waving a knife, at waving him. a knife at him, and he's like, "No, baby, don't do it." And and uh, they just move from room to room, and she changes outfits, and it's like I think it's supposed to be sort of like they're uh, flirting, like it's 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 murder, but it's also sex. But it's it's neither. No, yeah. It's just some it's, of the worst attempts at banter and bits I have ever fucking seen. Okay. Yeah, like she'll yeah she'll like take out some like supposed to be comical weapon like a huge knife or like a samurai sword and be like, it's a shame that we I have to get rid of you because I had such a good time when you put your penis in my vagina. <laughs> and he'll go. He'll like sing an 80s song and she'll sing the hook to it. And he'll go, That was pretty cute what we did. And she said, We're adorable, but I've got to cut off your head, even though the way that you found my clit was bloody brilliant. <laughs> and then they'll like do his Scooby Doo So, chase. like, I, there's a thing where she, she, she tries to go, she goes through all the ways she's planning to kill him and like dismissing them because they're cliche because they've been done in other movies. And she like takes out a gun and she's like, Oh, a gun. That's been in plenty of movies before this. And then just like, I'm, God, I'm doing an Australian accent now. I mean, like, the voice she's doing in this is very... It, it's, she goes in and out of her Scottish Inventive. accent. Like, yeah. And then she literally, like, lists every movie that's featured a gun. And they speed yeah. up the dialogue so it's, like, even more meta. And it just... Blah, 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 like, you know, John Wick, Dirty Harry, uh, Die Hard. Just, like, it just goes through it. And then she, like, settles on using nunchucks and explains what nunchucks are and then doesn't use them. Uh, but then yeah. I want to get to the point where Ed Wiswick uh, is basically like, he's like, oh, why are you trying to kill me? I thought we had chemistry. I thought we had like a zing. And they're like, yeah, we've got a zing, a zing, a ding, a zing, a ring, a ding, do a zing, a zing, a bup, <laughs> zing, a down, zing, a up. Like, no, that's five minutes of dialogue. I'm not exaggerating. That's five minutes of dialogue. There's another five minutes of dialogue where they just go back and forth on whether something is, as I alluded to before, a couch oh, or a sofa. No, no, and he goes, no. he goes, you know, if you take one step further, I'm going to pour red wine on your beautiful Italian couch. And she's like, it's a sofa, dear. And he goes, couch, sofa, couch, sofa, couch, sofa. And they just said they don't, they just, there's, no, <laughs> in, there's no embroidering it or adding bits or detours. It's just them saying it back and forth. It's so, it is so abominable. Holy shit. So at one point, Ed Westwick, as he's being, you know, sort of, as, they, as they're literally running in circles around her house, um, uh, discovers her, like, garage freezers that are just filled with body parts. And at this point, you think, like, it would make some nod to the fact that like this has gotten 
I, either either you would you would push it to it's so absurd and then like like a sort of like a like a splatter kind of like Peter Jackson kind of thing, or there would be some intrusion of reality to be like, hey, oh wait, this lady's actually like a fucking mass murdering homicidal maniac, and then like Ed Westwick is like, you know, how could you do this? How could you kill all these people? And she starts explaining that all the people she's killed are bad people. And so she's doing like a Dexter thing. And like up until the movie, like we've already seen her beat a man to death just simply for leering at her and being ugly. And then she tries to justify what she's doing by claiming that every one of her victims was either a sex trafficker, a member of Al Qaeda, a child pornographer. And then they get like, even like she kills a guy for street harassing her. And then she says she kills a guy for being Republican, which is really funny considering who she's married to. But then, of course, well, then she, she says, says Democrat. She says Democrat and independent as well. She says she kills someone for leaving a dog in a hot car. And I know I know it's supposed to be funny. I know it's supposed to be like this is this is absurd bants we're doing here. But it, it, I think it, that this scene really re- does reveal okay, this scene. And then later, what she justifies it by saying that she's saving the taxpayers of California seven point five million dollars from like what the trial or like housing someone in prison for the crime of like littering would cost them. And I think that this is a sincere expression of like how Louise Linton views the world and like how yeah. she views like the like the ideal of like philanthropy and like what the what the role of Steve Mnuchin and wealthy people in American society really is, which is to save taxpayers money by exterminating the unworthy. Yes. Yeah. Everyone has like a dollar value. And if you fall below a certain threshold, you just get written out of the equation. And, you know, and when, she says, when she says I, she says I've saved the taxpayer, the good taxpayers of California, seven point five million dollars and then like looks directly at the screen and goes, you're welcome, California. And then Ed Westwick looks at her and he goes, thanks, Catherine. And she goes, you don't pay taxes. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> you're not worthy. You can't thank me for all these people I've killed because I didn't do it. Yeah, you, you don't even you're not you're not a stakeholder. And this you is where, like, when, like, uh, she would clap back on the haters on uh, Instagram. Oh, yeah. She would, yeah. Her thing that she would go- say, like, her standby was, What are you doing for the country? Yeah. Because she's <laughs> like, like, I'm I going to. More, I pay more taxes than you do. Like, that, and that is, that is a very common rich person thought, which is, we pay most taxes, which, duh, they have the most of the money. And so they really do think that that gives them more of a say and makes them more, uh, yeah, like it even makes them more philanthropic in a way because they're contributing yeah. to the general welfare with money that they're required to give the government. And that they, they, they spend every waking minute trying to avoid doing as well and pay, le- like pay less money in taxes. Like, you know, there's a, there's a whole industry that exists to help them do that. And then it's revealed that, you know, the, 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 ha- the connection between them, the reason that she invited this like seedy con man to like rent a room at her place in the first place is because in his prior crimes, Ed Westwick has ripped off her grandmother, who's like the one person that she is like a family member that's in her life. So like that's why she was going to kill him because he he stole from her grandmother. And like I just like when it introduced this whole idea about like like there's a there's like a moral project behind her mass murder. Yeah. I, I thought mm-hmm. like they, they, it was so absurd that like the movie was going to some place where they would be they would be punished for this. But no, no, that's that's no. not what happens at all. It is they are uh-uh. unambiguously, un like without any caveat or like in any way, shape, or form. This movie en- ends up in a place where they are unambiguously celebrated for killing all these people, getting away with it, and leading a fantastic, happy, and love-filled life because they found love. My favorite moment is that she says that she stopped lying to her therapist about her, her mental health issues, and they have her on. Uh, a bunch of pills that don't make her want to kill people anymore. So it's okay. She just tuned up the old brain chemistry. She doesn't want to kill and eat human beings anymore. Also, them getting together involves her agreeing to overlook the fact that she stole the, he stole her, her car and ripped off her grandma and him overlooking and forgiving the fact that she killed hundreds of people and secretly fed him some of them. Yeah. Those are the two things they have to like let go, bygones be bygones about. They get married at the end of the movie. The, the yes. last time of the movie is just they're on a couch together and they're sort of exhausted from trying to kill each other. And that's the other weird part is that Ed Westwick doesn't really ever really defend himself or try to kill this woman who's trying to murder him. They do and a like, terrible it, scene where they like punch each other back and forth. But like like it's slapping. Haymakers. Like, oh, yeah. But that's it. Yeah. You, you know what? This is when I got when we got to the end and then that the marriage scene. 
It occurred to me this is the movie Christopher Moltisante would make if Tony hadn't <laughs> killed him. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like, it, it, very cleaver. Yeah. Absolutely. 100%. And they're also, not only do they get married, there is a credit sequence of just home video footage of them with their little kid that they have. Yes. Yeah, just and like, like celebrating Christmas and getting frolicking. a puppy. Yeah. And it's like you could say... You could say that that's like some sort of ironic commentary on how the bad and rich win in this country, but that it hits different when it's literally the passion project of a bad and rich person. Yes, yes. It's impossible to interpret this movie as Louise Linton sort of winking at what an awful so, uh, narcissist she is, because like that, that's just what the movie is. And like, you know, obviously you can't fall into the trap of being like, oh, well, if the movie doesn't punish the evil person, then it endorses all of their actions. But this movie, it, like, is 100% that. Like, there is no indication whatsoever on the part of the, like I said, the auteur who created it, written, directed, and starring, that, like, that, 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 that betrays any indication whatsoever that her character is anything less than cool and admirable. Yeah, and it really is. It, the fact that she got to make this movie with... A, a, a decent budget uh, with some sort of distribution uh, that she just, this dog shit script that she wrote, incompetent direction she did, awful acting, with this story of the, the, the redemption through love of a serial killing hedge fund manager. The, the only way you can take this movie is, is like a fucking Jack the Ripper letter. Yeah. Like this, is, this is the demons who rule us. One of them just just doing an end zone dance in our faces about, yes, this is what the world is. We get to do this. We get to make, we, we get to take the money that we have and make monuments to our own twisted, psychotic visages. And then you get to watch it. The Mnuchins are the ones who will not be blamed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I, I'm just like, looking at my notes, and it's just like halfway through, I just wrote down, I'm hating every second of this. And then it's, the next line is, she farts in his face. She does. I really, I, does. I, I, I really, I, I like, am sort of ironically praising this movie, but I'm not kidding. Like, I did not have a bad time watching it. Like, I, I think this might be sort of like a litmus test in types of people we are, but it was so fucked up and, like, disconcerting that I was like, this is, like, I love this as, like, I forget if it was you or Matt who said it, but it was a very insightful thing about Christian movies where the best ones, you see the huge gulf between what they wanted to do and what they were technically and artistically able to do. Yeah. And I felt the same thing here. I like, I really enjoyed watching this. I really enjoyed it because I can safely say it's not like anything else I've watched for the show or really like ever. That I think is the only, for sure. The only, the only thing that would be like this is like, you know, in those Central Asian countries where they the same guy's been in charge for 50 years and everyone worships a statue of him. If like when they make movies about themselves. Yeah, that's the only compromise. <laughs> yes. I've ever actually seen yeah. one of those. Yeah, because there are movies that are by like they're vanity project movies by by maniacs and narcissists. But there's usually some uh budget restraint that gives yeah. them a charm if nothing else but because there's like an underdog element to it even though tommy was so uh you know had secret millions of dollars that he got from organ harvesting in poland or whatever allegedly <laughs> the, the, his 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 uh shaky command of english and the fact that he didn't know how to make a movie and basically rented a, a crew that give it that charm this is a professional sleek production made yeah, by yeah. this person of just unlimited wealth. So there's no charm to be had. And that makes it in its own way compelling. I think you're right about that. Yeah. No, it's I really I really can't think of anything else that it's like. And I think just you very rarely get like an unfiltered look into the mind of someone this wealthy. Yeah. Yeah. Every time they they meet you in the world it's going through 50 layers. Think about like the sort of like lovable, but stern science guy image of it. Like Bill Gates has, or like the, Oh, I drive, I go to the same diner and live in the same yeah, like, fucking, fucking uh, shitty house. Buffett. Warren Buffett. Yeah. yeah. Or, or like, yeah. Or even like, you know, sent a millionaire, or like low billionaire people who are more in the sphere of entertainment, somewhat like Linton where it's like, Oh, well I have a charitable organization where yeah. I you know, fucking teach girls how to sing or some shit. 
Uh, this is what they really are. And to that end, I kind of <laughs> wish more people yeah. would watch it. I mean, I, like, I, yeah. for me personally, every second of this movie felt like I was getting a tooth drilled. But you're <laughs> right. Like, it, it is useful in giving you, like, the probably the most honest and, like, unfiltered approximation of what goes on in, like, the, the mega yeah. wealthy's brains so, and their worldview. I, I, so one, I, one I, watched, I, I watched two sort of, like, two kind of propaganda films this weekend, right? Like, I watched this, but... The movie I watched before was Hero. You guys have seen Hero. The Jet right? Li movie, Jet right? Li yeah, movie. yeah, yeah. I love that movie. It's beautiful. It's like one of the most beautiful movies I've ever seen. The characters are great and tragic. And it, the, the choreography is like some of the best I've ever seen. The soundtrack's amazing. It's brilliantly directed. One of my favorite movies. But it's also like, it's like a propaganda movie. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Like, it is. It's a propaganda movie in that, like, hey, we all have to unite under, we're one people, we all have to unite under this one banner, we need order, even if someone's a, even if someone's a hero, they still have to die for the greater good, like, you know, one China going forward forever. And I would actually argue that this movie is that, but for the super wealthy. <laughs> but the okay. gulf, like, the gulf between... Like the gulf between them is so insane and sort of reveals like this is the future of America, just sort of hyper rich individuals creating either heavily filtered or very rarely like this, very naked portraits of their own in fucked up psyches versus hero, which is about the collective. Yeah, because this is and, one rich person using yeah. their money to make a movie. It's like fucking uh, Citizen Kane's girlfriend. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, like, but as, but like, as propaganda, though. I mean, like, it's hard for me to imagine the utility of this f towards the ultra wealthy because, uh, at face value, it is one of the most like hateful and poisonous depictions of like <laughs> yeah. uh, of, of a worldview and an, and and a single individual I've ever seen. There's one line at the end of this movie that was like so stunning to me, certainly in light of her marriage to Steve Mnuchin. Is so that they're married at the end, and she and they're yeah. both and they're both doing a monologue that like echoes what she did by herself in the beginning that like lays out all of the poisonous ways that she accrues her Croesus like wealth and all of the stupid like spin classes and she does and like the products that they fucking buy and the clothes they wear and all that dumb shit and they're lying in bed together and like again breaking the fourth wall Louise Linton looks right at the camera and says the authorities have not caught up with me for which I'm grateful and it was just like. Can, can we screen this movie for the FBI? Can we just show them this movie <laughs> and be like, this, 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 look, look what they're doing. Like I said, they're doing, they're doing, they're, they're high stepping, they're, they're 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 high stepping into the fucking end zone. Well, yeah, no, that, well, that's the thing. Like they both present these ideas that are like, if you just presented them on their face would be not as palatable to people. And for hero, it's like, you may have to die. You may have to suffer for a collective project, for our, for our unity, for our path forward. And that's like you just take any guy out and you're like, hey, would you accept on any given day being killed by a bunch of arrows? <laughs> to protect the, protect the yeah. emperor. I mean, and it's like yeah. and it's like, no, but it's done in such a way that it's like, no, that's beautiful. He had to do it. They both had to do it. And in this movie, it's like anyone who isn't us should die as part of my personal growth. Yeah. And you and know what? Like, that's yeah. like that's propaganda in the sense that it it's uh, an advertisement for the fact that it doesn't have to convince anybody anymore. Right. Right. Yeah. You, we have the money. You can't stop us. We get to make this. We don't have to worry about what you think about us. Right. You no, know, but like if, if this movie does have an ideology, we talked about like the Mnuchin cast of this movie, like as it relates to suicide squad, but like there's a, there's a moment at the end of this movie that like where it's, it's supposed to assure you the viewer that she's better now and is not a psychopathic murderer. And it does that by she like she helps some ugly person in the spin class like put <laughs> fix their fat foot onto the cycle pedals. Yeah. And then she That's says the thing. And then she says, she says, you know, it's not good to judge people for their lifestyle choices or political affiliations. But the entire it's like, well, that's what to me, don't do that. But to everyone else, everyone else is a lower person. Yeah. Who can be killed as some for someone's like journey of personal development? Yeah, <laughs> like it's like that's literally it. We are meat. Yeah, 
I I really recommend people watch this. I really do. I if I, you can I, stand I, it. I, if, I don't. I it, don't. If it doesn't but. give you the Menneker <laughs> nausea, if if you, if you if you're able to take uh, uh, this kind of defilement of the the art form of cinema. No, a, a defilement uh, of humanity. Of, I'm not. Yeah. A, I'm not the art of cinema. This movie is. It, it defiles what it means to be a human being, in in, in a <laughs> truly, <laughs> truly upsetting way. I did not find it that upsetting. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's because I didn't. Felix, it, no, what's, uh, what's upsetting that this about might it? Be because you, in fact, are a twisted psychopath. <laughs> no, no. I think, like many of my generation, I grew up watching Live Leak, and it <laughs> gave me a higher tolerance for things. Now, yeah, it, this it is, is like you've, how many ISIS Manny videos have you watched? This is not a big deal. Well, I watched a lot of the Al Qaeda videos when I was a kid. <laughs> okay, I, I, I don't mean like it's not so much it's 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 repellent moral view of the universe or of of human beings in general that makes this movie like i said a a desecration of like the human soul it's 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 it's, it's in the attempts to be funny and yeah. do goofs spoofs Brutal. gags bits and bants that this movie oh. becomes something that is um, like sacrilege, it, it, real it violence. Is, like there's no, yeah, there's yeah. very little blood on screen, but those the 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 bits, the riffs are violence. Yes. They're poisonous. They're poisonously <laughs> bad riffs. Yeah. We can all agree on that. They're some of the worst I've ever fucking seen. Yeah. But again, this is. I'm a collector. <laughs> I love collecting these things. I love like it's important to me. It's not as important to other people. I. I I'm obs- I'm also obsessed with shitty comedy. That's yeah. another thing I love about this movie. I love comedy. I have another mm-hmm. friend, another friend, Tom, a Finnish, actually a Finnish man, <laughs> pretty funny. But uh, he um, he he said one thing about comedy once that I found incredibly insightful. Also, he said that um, humor and more of, like more more specifically like laughing at a joke someone tells is a way to understand them. Yeah. And it bri- and it, it it's one of the best ways to bridge divides because it is one of the most revealing things about the teller of the joke, right? Yeah. And I think like shitty very like arduously attempted comedy like this also similarly reveals a lot of things about people. Maybe that they wouldn't want you to know. And I I I love shitty comedy. Like I love I scroll through the Babylon Bee all the time because it <laughs> fucking sucks so much. And I'm I'm like fascinated by it because it gives me more insight into that mind than like anything else would. People like, will reveal everything about themselves through that process. Uh, this, this this will be my final thought on the movie, but like in, in light of, of of how of how humor and like, especially a vanity project art like this can reveal things that are like d- deeply truthful about the people who who produce them and create them. My my real dream uh, for something that could grow out of this film is something that we've been thinking about or fantasizing about for a while: a definitive fictional narrative film about the Trump administration from the perspective of Louise Linton, where she plays herself and Steve Mnuchin also plays himself. And it's their perspective on, the, on, on four years in the Trump administration. Because as we said, Mnuchin is one of the only guys that lasted all four years. Yeah. Trump he, never turned on him. Trump, yeah. like, all the way through. Because he's a Hollywood guy. Because that's what yeah. Trump really likes is celebrities and famous people, which is why QAnon is one of the most hilarious concepts in history. And you, you know, at war with Hollywood. And you know all those like all those like shitty books and editorials that are like I was uh, I was um, I was in charge of the child molestation program at the border, <laughs> but when Trump criticized the Boy Scouts, I had yeah, to no, no, no like, Felix, all, Felix, all all all, all those. It, this is exactly like, what I'm looking for because it's like they will of course be looking for a way to separate themselves from the Trump administration. So I want them to make a movie that's about like their struggles to do the right thing. In the Trump administration, through the sec- through the Department of the Treasury, but okay. but, it, but it's starring them as themselves and is their honest attempt to rehabilitate their own images, um, in light of the fact that they served with <laughs> for four years under the Donald Trump administration. And, and I mean the that thing- they both served because, like, she might they as both, well have been served. a cabinet secretary as well. They confirmed her. Well, like I, that's my point though. Is Mnuchin did do more than those guys? Like oh, yeah. the malign, malign Trump's worst impulses often. Like, it's still not good to be Trump's Treasury Secretary. Like, he's definitely a bad person for a billion reasons. 
But if you have that theory that like, oh, there are people in the Trump administration like working to save this country. Well, I can only think of one guy who did yeah. anything to help anyone in that position. It was fucking Steve Mnuchin. Yeah. And then they could make a movie about that, of highlighting their their uh, virtue and, and their mm-hmm. commitment to the American people. I would love to see them. She needs to write the script. Yes. Yeah. We can get Brendan would, Gleeson and, and back have as like, Trump. And she'll have House of Cards style, like turn to the camera, address the audience kind of thing, where she's just like, she'll be explaining, you know, why they did certain things or what she was thinking at the time. I mean, I and, was, yeah. And, and if Steve Mnuchin is anything like the font of charisma and talent that Louise is, <laughs> I mean, we're looking, I think I smell Oscar in the future for this project. Louise, Louise, I uh, recently had a back injury earlier this year, but I am now back to normal. I'm going to the gym five times a week. Uh, if you make this movie three months from now, I will be able to play a trainer part. <laughs> <laughs> there needs to be. An I am not. I am not part of the Screen Actors Guild. I'm totally against those people having unions. <laughs> and uh, there definitely needs to be an extended scene where they flew on a government jet to Fort Knox to see the eclipse. That was awesome. <laughs> that was so good. I fucking love. Remember when Axel Rose was like, fuck you, Steve Mnuchin on Twitter? And Steve, Steve Mnuchin from like the Treasury account yeah. was like, what have you done for this company? <laughs> uh, chi- Chinese <laughs> democracy? It's what he's done for China, not America, Steve. Yeah. Come on.